versus somebody who comes in, gets saved, and lets the doctrine become perverted. So Paul is saying, look at me. At one point, I was a blasphemer. I persecuted the church. I injured Christians, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief versus the person who's in the church and start tearing up the church. A person who's in the church, and they are not ignorant, but they target people to bring them down like they're clams or crabs in the bucket. If you got issues, keep your issues to yourself. If you got problems, deal with your own problems. Don't say, I want everybody stinking up with me because I'm stinking it up. Just say, Lord, work on me. And, you know, it is what it is. But you know how people are. If they're a mess, they say, well, let's see if I can create some other mess. So we all be in this mess together, you know. And so he says, um, and where we at? 13? 14. 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant mm. with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, he totally gives credit to the Lord, the Lord saving him, because think about it. The Lord could have killed Paul when he was out there killing the church. When he was out there persecuting Christians and having them crucified and executed and stoned, the Lord could have killed him. And look what he does. He says, uh, and the grace of our Lord. Now, now look what he does. He says, exceedingly. One word defines how important and how huge and how big this was to Paul. He said, exceedingly abundant. The grace of God was more than just the average amount of grace. He said, man, how bad I was. The grace was huge. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Big grace. See, someone who was already a nice person and don't have to look back over their life and say, man, I was a wretch. They understand grace, but not to the level of a person who says, man, I was a killer. I was a mess. And that's the person who sometimes gets saved and they tear up the church every Sunday because they're going, man, I was a complete mess. And the worst part is when you get saved and find out I'm still a lightweight mess and grace is still working on my part. You know, when you do pull it together, you like, man, I can appreciate grace even more. See, I always tell you guys, it's one thing to get mercy to get saved, but it's another thing to have mercy after you get saved. It's a greater appreciation of mercy because you're going, I got problems with it, and I know I got problems. I ain't ignorant no more. I'm not one of them cats that's out there like, man, I got saved, and I was out there wilding and didn't know better, and I thank God for his mercy and grace for saving me. Versus, I'm saved, and I still got problems, and I'm crazy, but God has mercy and grace on me. And that's a whole different level of grace and mercy. You're going, wow, I can't even understand why God would deal with a person who knowing me is acting a fool. You know, that's what really makes you understand and appreciate God's grace and mercy. So Paul was saying his grace and his mercy is abundant, succeeding. It's more than what I even anticipated with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and, a, uh, and worthy of all accept, acceptation. So he's saying, what I'm telling you is truth, and I'm telling you, you need to embrace it. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, this is what I love about Paul. He didn't talk and preach down his nose at the people. Mm -hmm. Talking about y'all need to get yourselves together. He was saying, look, I'm telling you right now, the whole sum of the gospel, is Jesus Christ came into this world to save folk. That we do not have permission to preach any other method of salvation. And this was the problem with the church at the time. They start saying, well, if we all lead to one final sum. Or all religions lead to God. Mm -hmm. And all this, that right there is secular religion. Mm -hmm. That right there is uh, trying to unify all religions and put them into this big rainbow. Mm -hmm. And it's not. This is what gets the, the, the big three in trouble, you know, which is Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. We all saying, nah, man, we, we ain't one. Now, from the outside looking in, people are going, well, no, you all believe in God. Nah. See, when you say God is a general term, everybody's cool with that. But then you start saying, but who is God? You know, we call him Jesus, Yahshua, the Savior. The Jews call him Yahweh. But we say, but you don't understand, Yahweh is Yahshua. And they're going to know Yahweh isn't. And then the Muslims are saying, we say Allah. You know, and so we have a problem. And we're not going to settle and say, well, so we can all get along. Let's just say they all want it. We're not going to do that. And Paul said, there's only one way. Um, he says, now look what he says. After he sums up salvation, he says, of whom I am chief. 
So now he, he basically inserts himself, and I love the fact that Paul drops down to the level uh, and puts himself in the same shoes as everybody else. Think about it like this. Some people think that people get leverage based on their position area at a higher level than what everybody else was. She was the vessel that God used to bring Jesus Christ into the world. But notice that she had to get filled with the Holy Ghost just like everybody else did. So Paul was no exception. He was saying, look, man, we all need salvation. Not one man can say, ah, oh, that's for you all. I don't need to embrace Jesus Christ for salvation. Paul throws himself in front of everybody and says, I know y'all probably have done some nasty stuff, but I'm the chief sinner. If anybody deserved to go to hell, it would have been me. I was killing church folk. So God should have said, let me start with this knucklehead, but this is how powerful his salvation is. His saving power is to take the worst of the worst and say it. That shows us there's no sin that we can commit that God can't deal with if our heart is right. So for anybody who out there that, oh, I had an abortion, oh, I did this, and I committed this, and I did that, and they come up with all these reasons why they think God cannot forgive them. And God is going, what? You are totally disrespecting my level of grace and my salvation power. You know, there is no muck, no mire, no dirt, no whatever that can withstand God's saving hand. He said, is my hand shortened that it can't save? Mm -hmm. So you can't get too far out there to where God's hand can't reach you. If you still going, come get me, come get me, come get me. Versus going, uh-uh, I don't want it. Now that's when people get in trouble. But long as they're still reaching up, if I'm sinking in quicksand, I'm going to tell you right now, the last thing you're going to see go under is my hand. You know, I am not going to just say, well, this is my faith. I'm going to still, <laughs> long as I got a little breath in me, have that hand reaching up like something I might be able to grab on the way or somebody might, least, ah, I got you, dog. <laughs> I'm not going to say, well, let me just pull my hands down and sink. You know, I'm going to go down still reaching for somebody to rescue me and save me. And who knows, man, that last finger, before I go down, somebody's like, got it, got it, got it, get him back up. <laughs> you know, I want to be able to go down saying, somebody get me. I don't want to just uh, accept my faith. The same thing with the Lord here. He's saying, uh, Paul is talking about how powerful the salvation of Jesus Christ is. Because he himself was the chief sinner. How be it, for this cause I obtained mercy that in me uh, first Jesus Christ might shew forth all long suffering. He says, you know why Jesus saved him? To show everybody that if I save Paul's knucklehead, but anybody can be saved. Mm -hmm. Because now it shows the long suffering of Jesus Christ. And this is why he often targets the knuckleheads. This is why he often targets the prostitutes and the pimps and the players and the murderers and people like that who everybody else goes, ugh, throw them away. They're horrible for society. And God saves them and makes them a whole different person. And you go, wow, God is really real. He loves everybody. You know, <laughs> he tolerated Jojo, who was a murderer, and you know, so-and-so, who was a hooker, and so-and-so was a stripper, and this guy was a pimp, and this guy was a, a, a drug dealer, and God saved them. Man, and all I do is, you know, take pencils from the job. <laughs> you know, take them home. <laughs> like, here, kids, take these to school. You know, stuff like that. You know, it, it really puts it in perspective. You know, you say, well, man, I can go to the Lord. I would beat myself up over <laughs> You know, it's not that we downplay certain sins, but at the same time, it shows the average person that, man, I, God's in the saving business. And he'll go after somebody that you got and you say, that's nothing but God. Because mm -hmm. that person was a complete mess. And so, he says, how be it for this cause, I have obtained mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might shew forth all long suffering. Meaning, he tolerated Paul longer than he should have. He should have killed Paul when Paul laid his hands on the first Christian. When he said, hey, look, here's some Christians coming, let's ambush him. He should have been killed right then. But, tolerated him, he says, for a pattern to them, which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So in other words, understand what it does to the psychology of those who hear about Paul getting converted. So I'm the guy who's saying, well, did you hear about this Christian movement? And what do you think about it? And they're like, man, it must be something going on. Remember that dude, Paul? Yeah, yeah, Paul, he used to, he used to be you know, one of those killing Christians. Yeah, man, he's converted now. He's a Christian. Now all of a sudden I'm going, Paul? The, the Paul that was killing people. Yeah, that's him. Get out of here. Well, if he converted, it got to be something to him. Mm -hmm. 
You see? So this is why he was chosen. So the people who were questioning and doubting, once they heard about that, they're like, man, let me investigate a little more. You know? So he says, uh, now unto the king. Oh, I love this right here. Uh -huh. It says, and Paul just breaks it down and gets real spiritual right here. Because the terminology he uses makes you want to go into worship. Mm -hmm. When he starts doing it like this, he says, now unto the king eternal. He just throws Jesus Christ right up there in kingship. Now understand when people start talking about, well, how can God and Jesus be the same? How can the Father and the Son be the same? Well, look what he calls Jesus. Sometimes Jesus is called the king of kings, but then he's called the prince of peace. You know, so you have to understand that even though he's the king and he's the prince, he's still one God. So he says the king eternal, uh, immortal. I love these, these, these terms. In other words, he's everlasting, he has no beginning or no end, and then he's immortal. You can't kill him. Never again will they ever put their hands on Jesus Christ and be able to take his life. Because really, they didn't kill him the first time. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. I had to basically kill myself. I had to let myself be killed. Or else it would have been a wrap for all of y'all. And so he says that he's immortal. Nobody can make that claim. He says he's immortal. That's awesome. And you know what? I love the way he's created matter and life and everything. He makes life, in, in a sense, everything he creates, he won't even allow us to destroy it. That's what I love. Man has no power to destroy or create. Only God does that. Now, if you think about that, I boggled my mind, sitting back, thinking, how can we destroy a molecule, an atom? How can we destroy matter? And we can't. We have not brought anything to this planet that wasn't here from the time God created. And we have not taken anything off this planet from the time God created. There's no substance that was in this planet that we have destroyed. It just simply changes forms. If we sit back, every molecule from the day this planet was created is still here somewhere in some form or fashion. Whether it be in air, it's oxygen and gases, whether it be made into material, we can't do it. And I'm going, you mean tell me. <laughs> With all the modern knowledge and technology, if I took a fiber and said, I'm about to destroy this fiber, I can't do it. I can say, I'm going to burn it. Burn it and it turns into vapor. Then I track down the molecules in the vapor and I say, now I'm going to freeze it. You know, there's nothing you can do to get rid of it. God said, I haven't given you all the power to create and destroy, period. You might think it is destroyed because you don't see it anymore, but the reality is we can't take nothing away from it. Only God can do that, you know. So it shows that whatever he puts his hands on, he has complete power over it. We ain't got no power. We